Good evening, everyone. I'm Jason Newton, and over the next hour, we'll hear from the top Democratic contenders in the 2020 race for Baltimore City Mayor. Now, under normal circumstances, we'd all be in the same room together, but nothing is normal these days. So we're doing this virtually using the Zoom platform. Our questions tonight come from journalists here at WBAL TV 11, WBAL News Radio 1090, and FM 101.5, along with Maryland Public Television. I'll be in control of the time, but we can't control things like video quality and connection speeds. We did ask the candidates to leave their mics unmuted for the length of the debate, and as you'll soon see, that led to some candid moments. The Democratic candidates who qualify for tonight's debate are former Baltimore City Mayor Sheila Dixon, former Undersecretary of the Treasury for Domestic Finance Mary Miller, current City Council President Brandon Scott, former spokesman for the Baltimore City Police Department and the Baltimore County Executive's Office T.J. Smith, former Deputy Attorney General of Maryland Theru Vignaraja, and current Baltimore City Mayor Jack Young. Now, one more note before we get started. We did not edit any of the candidates' responses to our questions or their final statements. They said it, and you're going to hear it, and we hope you enjoy tonight's debate. From WBAL TV 11, this is Commitment 2020, the Baltimore mayoral debate. Our first question comes from WBAL TV anchor Deb Weiner. The response to the coronavirus pandemic has been the greatest test of modern political leadership. The recovery phase may prove to be an even bigger challenge, with some arguing that the decisions made by America's mayors will have generational consequences. Knowing that all cities may not survive this, what is your overall plan to grow the local economy and save small businesses while reducing the inequality that the pandemic has shown a bright light upon? All right, Deb, thank you for that question. First up in this round on question number one is Brandon Scott. Mr. Scott. Thank you, Jason. Uh, we know that COVID-19 is a public health pandemic and an economic fallout like we haven't seen in a lifetime. And if we can see uh, my leadership throughout this process, gives people a lens of what I would do as mayor of Baltimore. Uh, from meeting for making sure that we have the racial and zip code data, but also being the first in this race to put out a plan that talks about how we can deal with COVID now and after uh, COVID-19, this pandemic has ended. What do we have to do? We have to invest, making sure that we have a robust uh, workforce development program that focuses in on people who lost their jobs, making sure the city is ready to uh, commission on how we can come out of it, making sure that we're investing in our infrastructure programming that we need, investing in small businesses, in particular those in neighborhoods that are hit the most, but also make sure that we are uplifting city government and is making sure it's most efficient and effective as possible as we move forward in the future. All right, Sheila Dixon, you're up next. Thank you for that question. And this is a trying time and I do want to take a moment to commend the mayor as well as the governor for enlightening and keeping us apprise on this pandemic. You know, we faced challenges even before the pandemic as it relates to violent crime in our city, as it, as it relates to health disparities, as it relates to increasing opportunities for businesses within the city, particularly small businesses. And we're going to have to really step up in an aggressive way. And so I have a plan on my website, DixonForBaltimore.com, that talks about the recovery after COVID. And so we're going to increase and enhance um, a recovery plan for small businesses by providing loans and grants and opportunities. We have to work with our um, medical institutions to deal with this health um, pandemic, not only now, but in the future for those individuals who are facing chronic illness. And we've got to work cohesively to do this. I want to create a COVID-19 um, hotline that provides mental health services for our residents because when we come out of this, it's not going to be the same. And we're going to have to tighten up city government. We're going to have to streamline city government. And we're going to have to do it in an effective and efficient way. Ms. Dixon, extra time. Thank you, Mary Miller. You're up next. Thank you. I think the most important thing is to make sure we have the public health safety net in place as we plan for economic recovery. We need a fiscal plan for the city that will get us <clears throat> in the next couple of years which are going to be very difficult for the city when we turn the lights back on. I think we need to build bridges using our budget stabilization reserve. I also think that we need to tap the federal aid that is out there from the federal government, the treasury, the federal reserves, municipal liquidity facility. That's what can help us get across this difficult period for the city. 
Some specific ideas I have right now would be to use the opportunity to come back stronger as a city, to end the digital divide in the city by providing internet access to everyone, including for telemedicine. And I also think we should be working with the state to declare a public transit fair holiday for the rest of 2020. All right, Ms. Miller, that's, that's, that. that's, that. you. that's your time. Uh, through Vignaraja. Thank you so much for this important question. In 1918, the difference in the approach in Philadelphia and St. Louis became a textbook illustration of why leadership matters in the middle of public health crises. Philadelphia did it terribly, St. Louis did it well. Let's make sure that Baltimore is an example of how to respond to a global pandemic. We outlined a three horizon plan called from recovery to prosperity. The first phase is disaster relief and the details matter here, Jason, $250 million in uh, in immediate stimulus to make sure that our schools, which are empty right now, are having their heating and air conditioning units repaired, that our streets that are sparse right now are having repairs and renovations done. In the second phase, six to 18 months, we're gonna cut property taxes in half, starting uh, uh, immediately over the course of 10 years, and then invest in 10 specific industries. And in the long term, we have pledged to launch a next generation new deal our AA bond rating is not some trophy to be bragged about. It's an asset to be used, and now is the time to use it. All right, sir, thank you. Next up is Mayor Jack Young. Uh, thank you uh, for this opportunity. Um, I'm doing everything that these uh, candidates are talking about. I have a COVID-19 recovery team in place. Uh, we did a COVID-19 small business task force that's in place right now. Uh, we have a partnership with uh, Goldman Sachs and Lindsay uh, for $10 million for forgivable uh, loans. And as the mayor of the city of Baltimore, we did a $5 million grant program for small businesses. And if you look at what I'm doing right now for COVID-19, everything that I'm doing, we're leading around the country. Um, people are calling Baltimore to find out what we're doing and how we're getting it done. I was just cited on CNN this morning for the great work I'm doing. The White House has already commented on the great work I'm doing during this COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So I'm doing everything that these candidates are talking about. I'm doing it. They need to just look and see what I'm doing. All right, Mr. Mayor, thank you. And finally, T.J. Smith. So one of the things that we are going to have to do is a postmortem on our COVID-19 response and see how we can improve upon that. That's not to cast any dispersions on anyone. It's just to understand that this was a pandemic, something that we've never faced before. And I give the mayor credit for staying in the trenches under these circumstances. However, we can look back and say, were we supposed to be doing outreach to the homeless community sooner? Were we supposed to be doing outreach to communities of color that were gonna be greatly impacted to, uh, by this COVID sooner? So we have to look at that, understanding that we're gonna have additional waves of this in the future and ensuring that we have a better capacity to deal with it. We have to also look at the job opportunities that could come. I wanna really push the federal government for service jobs. We have to get into a more service oriented uh, job market, but also as we're producing more PPE, how can Baltimoreans who found themselves without a job get some of these jobs mass producing PPE uh, for residents and uh, businesses in and around the state. All right, sir, thank you. Question number two, this one comes from WBAL Radio's Brian Neiman. He has our next question. Baltimore continues to lose population while most American cities are gaining population. As mayor, what would you do to entice people to move into Baltimore as well as keep families that are here from leaving? Sheila Dixon, you're first. Well, first of all, we have to retain the population that we have. And so we have to address the crime in this city. It has been outrageous for the last five years that crime has been out of control. Even through this pandemic, we should not have had, we should have been able to reduce crime and we haven't. So we have to get more foot police out on the streets. We have to work with our state MTA police, our school police monitoring those areas. So crime is number one. Number two is education. We are falling behind with our kids right now. School will not open for the rest of the remaining season. We have to create, I want to extend the school day to provide safe havens for young people and adults. We need to deal with the, the digital divide as relates to our technology. I'm going to do with Detroit did. They put $23 million into um, laptops and tablets as well as internet services for our kids, because this is not gonna be over. And then we're gonna have to have testing at our schools for our kids. 
Why people leave the city is because of crime and education are the two main reasons. All right, Ms. Dixon, thank you. Ms. Miller. I have to agree the three top or two top issues are crime and education. The third one I would add is taxes. That's the thing I hear about a lot from people who leave the city. With the crime issues in Baltimore, we have to attack those with the same urgency we're bringing to the coronavirus. I would work with Police Commissioner Harrison to reduce violent crime and restore trust in policing by resolving the consent decree. On education, we need to make the Kerwin Commission uh, recommendations real. I will find the money and the budget to support the education reforms we need in Baltimore. The mayor needs to take accountability for educational outcomes. And finally, our tax structure is uncompetitive, inequitable, and broadly distrusted by the public. I want to raise income in the city of Baltimore, make us more reliant on income tax revenue, less reliant on property tax revenues, and I will bring those rates down for Baltimore to make it attractive to live here. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Vignaraja. Yeah, look, right now we expect families to pay twice as much in property taxes for their children to have a higher chance of getting shot on the way to a school where you can't drink water from the water fountain. It's outrageous. It's irrational and it can't work as a way to try to keep families uh, uh, here. It can't work as a way to recruit families here. We're gonna talk, I hope, about crime and education, but let me specifically talk about property taxes. The Washington Post just did a profile of Baltimore and said that our campaign and our approach to cutting property taxes was a potential game changer. We put out a plan to cut property taxes in half over the course of 10 years. Tony Brandon, the former head of WYPR, said that ours was the first strategy he'd ever seen that was both visionary and actionable. And I find it ironic that other people are talking about cutting taxes or gaining more from income taxes. Mary Miller uh, gave donations to Mitch McConnell the year after he dramatically reduced taxes uh, on the wealthiest people in our country. That is not the approach that Baltimore needs. Baltimore needs a responsible reduction in property taxes to complement improvements in school and addressing crime. All right, sir, I got to move on to Mayor Jack Young. Uh, thank you again. Um, my plan is to continue to use the Neighborhood Investment Impact Fund, Affordable Housing Trust Fund, to rebuild neighborhoods that haven't seen, uh, you know, any development in decades. And we also have to make sure that we give more resources to our schools. And that's why I created the Mayor's Office of Children and Family Success, because in order to reduce crime in the city and to make the city really um, attractive to outsiders, uh, we have to make sure we connect the dots that's causing all of the problems. We have to work with social service. We have to work with um, the Department of Juvenile Justice. We have to make sure that we strengthen the family by touching every agency that has anything to do with children and families, because that's how we're gonna reduce crime, strengthen families, bringing fathers back into the lives of their children and making sure that we have the best educational system in the entire country. T.J. Smith. Confidence, crime, and education. People want confidence in the government. They don't want to see a continued uh, uh, course of corruption that we've seen over the last 10 years. Our agencies have to get better. Our government has to get better. And when that confidence can be built, people are gonna be more likely to want to be part of the change. Right now, the confidence is shook in Baltimore. So as we rebuild the confidence and we truly attack the crime problem that we have, and we have to attack <clears throat> it on a short-term basis and a long-term basis because we want sustainability. I wanna do my eight years as mayor, and when I hand it off to the next mayor, I want them to be able to build upon even better gains than what we made. That's what we have to do. And we have to hold the educational system and dollars accountable. The, 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 the money that comes into this city and the money that's spent in our city has to be used appropriately to get the outcomes that are expected. And that will build confidence and keep residents here and grow more residents uh, to uh, come. Brandon Scott, you get the last word. Thank you. Listen, crime is number one. It's a disease that's been ravaging our city for the entire time that I've been alive and no mayor has yeah. fully addressed it. We're going to do that by focusing in on the removing violence from defenders, focusing on the flow of illegal guns into the city, focusing on group violence reduction, something that we know works from across the country, but also doing the tough work of investing in people and neighborhoods that have been forgotten in Baltimore like Park Heights, where I grew up, right? Understanding that education has not been owned by a mayor in Baltimore in my lifetime. 
how different would my life and the life of my friends be if we had fully invested in education when I was a kid? How many more of my friends would be alive? How many more wouldn't be in jail? How many more would not be drugs? We have to change by investing in the promise of our young people instead of investing in their failures, which we've done in our entire life. And lastly, we have to have a functioning government with roots out corruption that builds a better structure. And everyone knows that a new way forward is about building a better structure for Baltimore. To forward. All right, and Mary Miller, if you'd like to rebut to uh, Mr. Vignarajo, there was a direct comment made towards you. You can have 10 seconds if you like, or we'll move on. Sure, um, he referenced a political contribution from decades ago. I certainly don't support Mitch McConnell, nor do I approve of President Trump's recent tax cuts. I wanna be clear. I would not change the income tax rate in Baltimore. I would raise the base of income in the city by creating jobs here. Okay, you'll be up first with this next question here. This one comes from Jeff Salkin of Maryland Public Television. We just passed the five-year anniversary of the arrest and death of Freddie Gray. Two-part question, what does that mean to you on a personal level? And two, how would you rate the city's response in terms of reforming the police department? How can we do better? Now this is a two-parter, so you're gonna get an extra 15 seconds here. We'll begin with Ms. Miller. Sure. Well, I'm sorry to say, I don't feel that we've made much progress in Baltimore since the tragic loss of Freddie Gray now five years ago. When I walk the streets of West Baltimore in the very neighborhood where that happened, people tell me nothing has changed. And they express their deep frustration with the city for not changing the lives and the, the realities of their neighborhood. There are food deserts, they don't have good public transportation, there are very few signs of good jobs in the neighborhood, and the housing stock is decaying. This is really troubling that we can't make any progress, and I think our elected leaders really need to own up to this. It's been a very long five years. As to changing the culture of policing, I think that the consent decree really does give us the blueprint and the roadmap to change the way the community and the police interact. I'd like to see more urgency brought to that. I am eager to work with Police Commissioner Harrison to see how we can impl implement the consent decree more rapidly to restore trust in the police in Baltimore and improve our violent crime outcomes. All right, Mr. Vignaraja. You know, inequity has persisted in this city in so many ways, in so many places. And I'm gonna just tell a quick story. Uh, in September of 2018, there was a murder in Federal Hill. And in Riverside Park, there was a vigil on Monday night. The mayor was there, the council president was there, every camera from every news station, every reporter from every paper, and they lamented the death of this promising young man who was killed at the age of 26. The problem is that on September 27, 2018, he wasn't the only 25 or 26 year old that was killed. There was one killed earlier that morning and one killed later that night. On the Tuesday night, after that Monday night vigil, there was a vigil in McEldry Park. The mayor wasn't there, the state's attorney wasn't there, the council president wasn't there. There were 11 of us lamenting the death of a young black man killed in McEldry Park. And that tale of two vigils tells you all that you need to know. If we treat the murder of a young black man in one neighborhood and the murder of a young white man in another neighborhood so differently, what do you think is gonna happen when it comes to schools, to the digital divide, to the tax base, to inequities that have pervaded our city for generations. City politicians have had their chance. They've talked about this. They've used the platitudes and the sound butts, bites, but nothing has changed. They haven't led, I will. All right, sir, thank you. Go to Mayor Jack Young now, and if you'd like to respond, you can. Yes, um, number one, um, you know, Freddie Gray's death touched all of us. Uh, just like Freddie Gay, Gray, Gray was uh, murdered, I had three nephews and a cousin that was murdered. Nobody uh, knows the feeling unless you feel it yourself with your immediate family. Um, we have done a lot. Um, they say nothing has happened. Um, because of this um, uh, death of Freddie Gray, there has been the consent decree, which I put for the consent decree. There's body cameras on police officers now uh, that I pushed for and got passed through the council. Um, we're doing everything that we can. We're moving development into areas of the city, like the council president said, in Park Heights, um, in East Baltimore, uh, Druid Heights. I mean, we have development going all over the city of Baltimore in these same neighborhoods. That's why the neighborhood 
Impact Investment Fund was created, along with the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. So we're doing everything humanly possible. And I also want to go back to creating the Mayor's Office of Children and Family Success to make sure that our kids are engaged and they're in programs and that we're touching each agency that touches the lives of our children, including our school system. All right, sir. T.J. Smith, you're up next. Uh, sadly, uh, I'll say that uh, 2015 was a missed opportunity and lost opportunity because next thing you know, corruption became the headline again, whether it be through the police department or through city government, that became the focal point as opposed to the reforms that were necessary in the communities. I watched as the satellite trucks parked over there and it looked like Hollywood studios in West Baltimore, and that went on for several months and then everyone left and it was left to go back to the decay and destruction that it, it, it has been been the murders then continued and they continue to rise in the same communities that they've always been in so until we specifically focus on the specific areas that continuously have the problems we're going to continue to have the same problems the consent decree is something that is necessary to push forward reforms and a, and a, and a great uh, comparison of having a consent decree versus not is there have been three mayors thus far that have been in place for the consent decree and five police commissioners, but the standard remains the same. So it speaks about the lack of continuity that the city has had, that you need to have this vehicle in order to ensure reforms are put in place in order to get the police department really into a 21st century police department. Brandon Scott. Thank you, uh, Jason. This is very personal for me. Uh, the week before the unrest, took off in West Baltimore at Penn North. I was at Penn North with my 300 in March talking about how we need to reduce violence in Baltimore uh, and understanding that since that tragic death of Mr. Gray, a lot has changed, but still too much has not changed in Baltimore. Thinking about the corruption that came, thinking about that we had a mayor that I led the council and we pushed to make sure that she signed the consent decree so that we can even have it. Understanding that my equity legislation that will force the next mayor to operate through a lens of equity so that they won't have an option to invest capital dollars in these black Baltimore neighborhoods in East and West Baltimore that have been under invested in for generations on purpose. That kind of stuff happened. But I also know the frustrations of my position as a council person running. You need a mayor who believes in that. You need a mayor who will focus on those things. You need a mayor who will understand that violent crime has to be reduced starting in those neighborhoods. You have need a mayor that understands that you have to build a better system and not be corrupt and always act ethically. You also have to understand that you have to believe in the consent decree and make sure that the department does it and know that every other city that has one has reduced violent crime while implementing it in Baltimore will be next to do that in my leadership. All right, sir. Thank you. And Sheila Dixon. So... <laughs> Nothing really has changed, nothing but buzzwords. We had the foundations come up with a million dollars for the prior administration. You know, the one thing and why I'm in this race is because when you create infrastructures that are working, you build on those, you don't throw them away. You know, TJ's right, you need consistency. My administration put a plan in place where we were reducing crime, where we were getting illegal guns off the street, where we were dealing with drug addiction, where we were working with ex-offenders before coming out, strengthening them with their families. You know, when we talk about duplications, we had children, youth, and family that already exist. It was a quasi-city nonprofit where they could go after grants. Sandtown and that whole community could be totally different today if emphasis were put in there. That's why when we focus on Druid Heights, which is right at Pennsylvania Avenue, to create new home ownership through opportunities. When, we, when I went during the Freddie Gray riots, rolled up my sleeves, I wasn't in public office, but I went into that community to see how I could help to organize them to get their elected officials to work for them because we have to empower people to realize that we work for them, not the other way around. And they have a voice, but they have to be organized. And so that's where I put most of my emphasis during that time. And I will put that kind of time in when I become mayor again. Okay, we gotta keep moving. Question number four. This one comes from 11 News I team lead investigative reporter, Jane Miller. While we've seen some reduction in gun violence during the pandemic, this is a problem, as we all know, that has been very difficult to solve for many years. What is the one thing you would do beyond focusing on violent offenders, which every mayor promises to do, the one thing you would do beyond that to bring about sustained reduction in gun violence? And a reminder, we're going back to our one-minute standard here, and we'll start with Rubik Naraja. 
You know, I have spent my career fighting crime. I was a federal prosecutor, city prosecutor, and then deputy attorney general of Maryland. We know that we can achieve where we need to get because we've done it before. We had murders below 200 in 2011 and 2012. We can do it without mass incarceration or mandatory minimums, without cash bail or policies of zero tolerance. At through2020.com, we outline a 20 point plan that pledges to do things that have never been done in the city before. A uh, wiretaps, the 12 deadliest neighborhoods uh, that account for 26% of the murders. Uh, diversion programs for low level offenders to apprenticeships and jobs in a holistic way to give them the kinds of jobs that they need. Detroit elected a prosecutor in uh, as mayor, crime went down. Chicago elected a prosecutor as mayor, crime went down. New York City elected a prosecutor as mayor, crime went down. Different strategies were used in each city, but having someone who cares about this issue, that knows the issue better than anyone else, is critical to turning around this problem. All right, Mayor Jack Young. Well, you know, this is a systemic um, cross-generation problem. Uh, we have to continue to invest in our youth, we build in our communities, and a robust job training facilities that are key uh, to helping us to reduce crime in Baltimore. And we need to connect the dots between social service, the school system and job training um, to figure out how we can heal our families. That's why I go back to the children and family success, which was totally different from what Mayor uh, Dixon alluded to. It was a failure. That's why it was ended by the previous um, two mayors. Um, I think that um, we have made some progress uh, we have uh, micro zones uh, in those communities where most of the crime is uh, being committed. Um, we're setting up community intelligence centers. We have two, and we're getting funding to do more so that we have real-time data so that we can track where these crimes are. And we work with our federal and state partners. Um, and one thing we did was the regional gun stat using that data and closing gun trafficking because we know that these guns are coming from outside of Baltimore. So we're doing all those things. All right, sir, I and gotta, job training we're doing. I got to keep moving, sir. Family success is really making a difference in what we're doing in the I city hear you, of Baltimore. sir, but, but I got to keep going. T.J. Smith, sir. Well, uh, I wish there were one answer, but there's, this is a multifaceted answer because we have to look at the long-term strategies and the short-term to keep people safe. The long-term strategies, of course, investing in a world-class educational system that shrinks the pool of people who want to go into crime. Our kids have to graduate college or career ready. Um, and if that's not happening, that's more opportunity for crime. But also having a relationship with gov the governor in order to do behind the walls treatment and training that is critical people are less likely to reoffend and commit crimes if they leave prison with a job that has to happen but we have to focus on the here and now and actually hold gun offenders accountable and interdiction gun interdiction as the mayor just spoke about we have to climb that ladder of gun interdiction and go after the people who are bringing all of the guns into Baltimore because they're not being manufactured. There's one gun shop in the city of Baltimore. They're not being stolen from gun shops and they're not being stolen from people's homes. They're right, being sir. trafficked into, into the city. Brendan Scott. Thank you. We all know this is a deep issue. So a few things that we're gonna talk about very quickly. And this is something that I'm very passionate about because I have been the victim of gun violence in Baltimore. It's different when they point it in your right? We know that we need a group violence reduction strategy. We know that a small group of people on another small group of people in Baltimore has failed, not once, but twice to implement that. Because it's not just about Jason bringing those people in, but it's also about giving them the opportunity to change their life. It's also about timely intelligence and sharing, it's something that the police department has done a bad job over recent years, not sharing the information quick enough and people die who shouldn't. It's also about doing that tough work, understanding that gun traffickers and stuff <laughs> are just as guilty as the people pulling the trigger. We know that I'm leading them, passing a law, adding gun offend, gun traffickers and straw purchases to our gun offender registry. But we also know that we can invest in a reentry a different way by taking the Office of Employment Development into the prison, working with labor unions, working with our businesses to train those people for the jobs in our neighborhoods for when they return today. All right, sir, keep moving here. Sheila Dixon. So one, we have to deal with um, the gun registry, which I created, where well, we registered those individuals who had illegal guns. But not only do we track that information, but we went and we visit them. We went and visit them through parole and probation and other organizations. And we knocked on the door and we asked, what are you doing? You need a plan of life. We helped to create that opportunity where we were able to 
take those individuals who are on parole and probation and assist them with finding a path. Long term, this is a holistic approach, and I would encourage people to go on my website, DixonForBaltimore.com. Yes, we have to deal with our education system. We have to deal with the drug addiction that impacts our families. We also have to look at tracking those guns. We work with Mayor Bloomberg from New York down 95, tracking down in Virginia. We have to make sure that our police department is equipped to have the kind of expertise to go and track those guns, illegal guns. We should not be talking about this issue today. If we had kept a structure in place that was working and successful in this city. All right, ma'am. Thank you. We're gonna, um, go, to, we're gonna go to Ms. Miller now. Okay, because I need a rebuttal, Mayor Young. <laughs> Thank you. Um, there's a lot of good ideas that have been expressed here. I think that we need a leader in City Hall who can bring people together and put the best agencies and best work to, in place here. We don't need a prosecutor in the mayor's seat. We need someone who can lead, collaborate, and coordinate across all the parties that touch crime in Baltimore. On the gun trafficking point, I think that we could do a better job working with the federal agencies that can help us. This is not just Baltimore's problem. This is bigger than Baltimore. I've talked to former U.S. attorneys who think there could be a better relationship with the city. I also think we need to work on our de-escalation programs. Let's put more support behind safe streets. Work with the communities to develop community policing plans. Work with you know, our partners so that we can have a city that trusts that we're doing the right thing to reduce violent crime, bring everyone to the table on this. And as I always say, we don't just have a crime problem, we have an opportunity problem in Baltimore. All right, and Ms. we need to make those investments. Ms. Miller, thank you. We'll go back to Ms. Dixon. I'll give you about 15 seconds if you wanna to respond to the mayor. So Children, Youth and Family was very successful. It was a quasi city agency and nonprofit where it could go and seek out grants and opportunities. And there were a number of successful programs that came out of that. But see, part of the challenge that we face in the city is politics. Because the ideas of family strengthening did not come from a particular mayor or whatever, then people want to throw it away instead of building on it. We've got to get away from the politics and look at where we are successful and built on that. So I just wanted to add that. Okay, here we go with question number five. Uh, our hey, next I, question I comes from, Mayor, well, we'll, Mayor, you're gonna come up next here. Give me one second, we'll, we'll, we'll get in there. Right now? So, okay, go ahead, take 10 um, seconds, but we gotta get going, sir. Um, okay, um, my children and family success is totally different than what the mayor alluded to. And then the mayor alluded to something about uh, things that were working to reduce crime. I'm paying for her gun trace task force right now that I can use that money to spend somewhere else. All right, sir, we're gonna keep going here. Question number five, you'll be up first with this one. This question comes from Clarence Mitchell the fourth, host of the C4 on uh, C4 show, excuse me, on WBAL radio. In 1997, the Maryland legislature, and I was a member then, and Governor Paris Glendon created the state, city, Baltimore City Public Schools Partnership. The academic performance since then of Baltimore City Public School students has been abysmal. Will you, if you're elected mayor, work harder than previous mayors since 1997 to improve that academic performance plus improve the CTE vocational education programs? Mayor Jack Young, we'll start with you. Absolutely, because, you know, as a parent that have both of my children in Baltimore City Public Schools, they have a Baltimore City Public School education. I know how important it is to make sure that we have the best educational system in the country. And that's why I was the first out of the gate to say that I fully support the current commission to make sure that we get the money, to make sure that we have state-of-the-art 21st century schools, to make sure that we have art, music, and physical education, and all the other things that our kids need inside our school system. I think that once we uh, get the investment in the schools, and as mayor, I've made investments in the school system, $34 million to leverage $400 million in new school construction, making sure that we bridge the curve we continue to do the bridge to curve but right now with the pandemic i'm still committed to fully funding the current commission and fully funding our school system because our school system is the link to reducing crime in the city of baltimore all right sir thank you we'll go to tj smith um yes we we have to have a collaborative relationship and a vision with the baltimore city schools my mom's been teaching here for 36 years and i've watched her over my lifetime uh give her all to young people but we have to make sure the dollars are getting into the classroom and not and are not getting caught up in a bureaucratic process 
that is what is key to long-term sustainable uh, reductions in crime in the city of Baltimore. But we also have to look at opportunities that are unique to Baltimore. I look at all the vacant housing in our city and say, imagine the opportunities if we grow our trade programs of kids rebuilding this city where they can start in middle school and learning the art. When they get to high school, they're actually applying the art that they've learned. Mm -hmm. We have to be more creative about what we're doing and how we're educating our young people, but really focusing on the outcomes with accountability wrapped in and be able to get off the road and reset if necessary. And I do support the Kerwin um, uh, recommendations. And I think uh, that the uh, state uh, general assembly is going to override the veto so we can get moving with that. All right, TJ, thanks. Let's go to Brandon Scott. Thank you. Uh, Jason, I was in seventh grade uh, when the city-state partnership happened. And so I know uh, personally, as the only graduate of city public schools in this millennial in this race, what it means, how it feels to go to those you know, air conditions, what it means to not have to be here. Jason, do you want me to start? Yeah, over Mr. Scott, there? hold one second. And Mayor, if you could if you could mute your phone, I appreciate it. Sir. I did. Okay, thank I just you. Did. Thank you, Brandon. Well, gonna... you know I'm still running the city. I, I you know I, I, I hear you, sir. I hear you, here. sir, but I need you to hold tight okay. for me. Brandon, we're gonna reset here and go go ahead with that question, please. Thank you, Jason. Uh, I was in seventh grade uh, when the city state partnership was created. And I know personally how it is as the only graduate of Baltimore City Public Schools in this race from this millennia. How it is to go to those schools with no heat and no air, how it is to not have the materials that you need, how it is to not have a teacher for a whole, a whole semester in your classroom. We have not had a mayor in my lifetime that has owned education in Baltimore City Public Schools. I'm going to be that. I'm going to be a partner with the school system each and every day, making sure that we fully fund the Kerwin Commission because it's embarrassing that we have not been putting more again into the promise of our young people instead of invest, investing into their affairs. Understanding as a trade graduate from Mervo that CTE education has to be matched with the jobs and opportunity today. Why can't we do that? We know what the jobs are. We know what the businesses are. I will be a convener as a mayor, a leader as a mayor, showing people that it can be done to create a new way forward for our young people that will bring a better future to Baltimore. Sir, thank you. Sheila Dixon. I, I would have to first disagree with um, Brandon on not a mayor being committed to schools because as a teacher, that's why I got into public service and why I got into public life. And I never looked at that partnership as schools being separate from Baltimore City. During a recession, I was able to increase the budget in Baltimore City schools. I started the whole effort for community schools because I knew that if we put money into the schools and looked at what was needed based on the needs of the children, extra services and partnerships, that was gonna to help to enhance those schools. So my, my drive for this city to be successful is because of my desire and love for Baltimore City Schools. Bill Ferguson was an intern for me where I, we sent him to Baltimore City Schools to set up school stat. We monitored, we made sure that when the schools were accountable for every penny, when we had the $50 million deficit and we had to go to a rating agency to go into the rainy day fund and show them a plan of action. So not only in the past, but now I continue to work with schools Thank because you, I know how important they are. And as it relates to trades, we're gonna we have, have to, move. to have every child graduate. I gotta get moving, Ms. Dixon. I gotta, I gotta be fair on the time. I gotta go with Ms. Miller now. Thank you. Um, Baltimore needs to have more skin in the game on education, bottom line. We do not make this a priority in our budget. I think last year spending on public education was about 14% of the budget. My husband and I are both graduates of public education and we know what good public education looks like. I think it is almost the highest moral obligation of a city to educate its children well. I think the mayor should have a stronger working relationship with the school CEO and should own the educational outcomes in Baltimore. When I look at the proposed 2021 budget for the city, it includes metrics on educational attainment. They are very poor and they have not changed over years in Baltimore. It's time to change that. I support the Kerwin Commission recommendations. I also think we need to spend more on the physical facilities of our schools and including investing in trauma-informed education for all of the people who touch our children, 
as well as career and technical education. All right, the Rubik Naraja. Jason, I want to start by thanking Mayor Young for his phone going off. For those of you who can't see it at home, Sheila was about to bust out laughing, and we just needed a moment of levity because these are very serious issues. Um, education has been the foundation of my life. Uh, my parents are city school teachers. My mom taught at Poly in Morgan State. My dad taught at Edmondson and Douglas at Southern and Western. I'm the product of public schools. I went from Edmondson Heights and Woodlawn High to Yale College and Harvard Law School. I was president of the Harvard Law Review. I clerked on the US Supreme Court. And I came back here to devote myself to service because education made that possible. And here's the thing, Jason, everybody on this virtual stage agrees. We all believe in Kerwin. We all believe our schools need to be cathedrals. We all believe that we need more financial literacy and more trauma specialists and more nurses. We all believe you know, to drink water from the water fountains that the heat and air conditioning ought to work. The problem is the folks that have been responsible have not been getting it done. If you want politics as usual, if you think things are fine or things are going in the right direction, please don't vote for me. I'm going to disappoint you. We're going to rewrite the script all together. We're going to have a leader that gets it done. All right, sir, thank you. Our final question comes from WBAL-TV anchor Deb Wiener. As Baltimore emerges from this public health crisis, faith and trust in local authority will be paramount. But Baltimore residents have weathered a storm of corruption that has its former mayor headed to federal prison. What can you guarantee the citizens of Baltimore when it comes to your own moral compass and code of ethics? All right, Deb, thank you. This one goes to Brandon Scott first. Thank you, Jason. Baltimore, I've only served you to make our city better. Every day when I wake up, I do that serve you, knowing that I have to do it in the most ethical way. And I've shown that in my leadership. Right now, I'm running on the campaign and currently right now reforming city government, building a better structure, reducing the board of estimate structure to three, just uh, as we just saw last year, use be used for corruption, changing how we have a board of ethics that was underneath our Department of Legislative Reference, moving it to be underneath our Inspector General so that it can actually do investigations, doing things that will weaken our power as mayor, but that's the best thing for Baltimore because this race is not about Brandon Scott. It's about how Baltimoreans can believe in the government, believe in show that we have a structure that can move us together as we repair our relationship each and every day and showing that there's a new way to change Baltimore for the mayor that can't be bought, that can't be bossed, and always do what's in the best interest of Baltimore first. All right, sir. Thank you. Sheila Dixon, you're next. Throughout this campaign, I have been very transparent with the public, releasing my taxes, sharing my campaign finance numbers, whenever I've been asked. It's my commitment to this campaign to work three times harder than anybody else to be transparent. You know, I made a mistake and I have to live with that. And I know that I have to gain the trust back from the public. But I worked very hard for the past 10 years, regaining the public trust, and I know the more that work that I do, um, that I can accomplish it. But also, I just want to say this, you know, we have to um, make sure that whatever goes on in city government, the citizens need to know whether or not it's something that we um, want to share or not. To give you an example, through this coronavirus, you know, there were contracts that um, stopped. We should have notified those businesses and said, because of the coronavirus, we're not going to do business instead of giving people the runaround. So we have to be straight and honest and, and forthright. And that's what I'm going to do. Thank you, ma'am. We're going to move to Mary Miller now. I'd start by saying that I went through two very rigorous Senate confirmation processes to take two jobs in the Obama administration where my personal life, my taxes and finances were scrubbed thoroughly. And I was approved by both parties unanimously. So I would bring that level of rigor to Baltimore City. We need to do more on financial disclosure for elected officials. I don't think the ethics board is set up correctly. We cannot have elected officials appointing the very people that would then be investigating them and then not giving them sufficient budget. I appreciate you've moved the ethics board to the um, uh, independent auditor's office, but there's still not budget there for people. I believe in full transparency on my own finances, on my taxes, and making sure that no mayor ever holds business dealings while they're in office. 
I will be very independent. I'm not beholden to anyone, unions, special interests, or large donors. All right, thank you, ma'am. We're going to move to Thiru Vignaraja now. We became the first campaign in Baltimore mayor on history to release our federal and state taxes. We did it within a week of announcing. It was meant to signal a new era of unprecedented transparency. Uh, so many of our opponents have allegations of ethics violations, campaign finance violations, pension fraud, tax fraud. But at the end of the day, we are all public servants. We're all people of good faith. And so I want to take a step back and talk about what really distinguishes us. I am proud that I've devoted my life to public service as a prosecutor. I know the subject of crime better than anyone else. And if somebody thinks that that is a liability instead of an asset, then don't vote for me. I think this is our biggest problem. It's not our only problem, but it is the first one we need to address. But here's the philosophical difference, Jason. There was a mayor who once said, if a pigeon dies in the park, blame me. It was about leadership taking responsibility. If crime doesn't go down on my watch, blame me. If the schools don't get better, blame me. If the potholes don't get filled, if your trash is not getting picked up, blame your mayor. Because that's the person who's taking responsibility. That's not what politicians do. It's what leaders do. Gotcha, and Baltimore sir. desperately needs them. Thank you, sir. We'll go to Mayor Jack Young now. Well, um, I hate corruption, too. I'm dedicated to continue to increase transparency in government, um, which I value. And I have championed my entire career. Um, some of the accomplishments that I have made was the body cameras, making sure that all of our council hearings are televised so that the citizens can see who's making the decisions about things that go on in their community. And also having audits um, of every city agency. Um, the, the mayor uh, referenced contracts. I'm looking at every contract because I want to make sure there's no duplication in contracts, whether contracts have ended its life cycle and are we just renewing just to be renewing. And those are the things that I'm looking at, trying to find out where the duplications are, where we can combine contracts to get a better bang for our buck, and where we can include some of our young people to work on some of these contracts and have them trained so that they can be the workforce of the future on some of these major contracts that's in the city of Baltimore. All right, Mr. Mayor, thank you. We'll go to T.J. Smith now. Thank you again, Jason. And I, I want to lead by, by, by honor and integrity, something that I've had my entire career. Uh, I've been in law enforcement for a number of years, and there's never been a single brooch of my integrity or ethics. There hasn't been a hidden camera crew following me around. There hasn't been uh, other videos that I've been subject to. Um, there are other candidates who've dealt with that. Um, I haven't misused the pro public trust, and I've tried to be as transparent as I possibly can, even with the disparaging uh, stuff that comes along with being a political candidate. But I have to be above that because we have much bigger problems in this city. And my transparency, I think, is shown through the work that I've done for years. And I've been through vigorous background checks as well. Uh, so I just want to move forward with this city showing a different light, shining a different light on this city. And it goes back to the words I said earlier, confidence in city government and confidence in your leadership that they're gonna do the right thing. All right, TJ, thank you. We're gonna move on to closing statements now. And Ms. Sheila Dixon, you're up first. Jason, can I rebut Ms. Miller and Mr. Duke If it's quickly, if you can do 10, 10 seconds, that will help me a lot. Yeah, first, uh, first uh, Mr. Vigman Raja stated that he was the first to share his taxes. I shared five years of taxes in um, Tim of Texas in 2018. And to Ms. Miller's comment, yes, we did move the board of ethics. And as mayor, I will fund it. In addition to the things that we've done, that's closing the healthy holly loophole, we'll continue to change All right. and change in Baltimore. Thank you for being brief, sir. Sheila Dixon, you're up first with closing statement. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to speak before the public. Um, on WBAL. And let me begin by saying that, you know, one of the things you're going to hear a lot of commitments, a lot of promises, a lot of things that we've done and have not done, but no one has had the track record of reducing crime, being able to reduce the police department's overtime budget, to be able to put money into schools and create community schools within our schools, to be able to clean up the city in a way that had never done been done before, to green up the city by creating and enhancing um, um, tree canopy, to be able to look at our water and waste 
system that we had a consent decree and not increase the water bills by double digits, but to also look at how we do it responsibly. And I'm here because I committed to the city. I love this city. I know what it takes to be the kind of leader to bring people together of all walks of life in order to move the city forward. We should not be looking 10 years from now and be talking about these same issues if we create the infrastructure that's needed to build on our success. Ms. Dixon, thank you. Ms. Miller. Thank you. Thank you, WBAL, for hosting this debate. Baltimore is a city on the brink. Things could break very good from here or they could break very bad. We have the opportunity to come back stronger, but also to come back differently. Even before this crisis, nearly one in four city residents were living in poverty. Many more are barely surviving paycheck to paycheck. I want to attack racism and invest in the people and neighborhoods that have been intentionally left behind. We're all frustrated with the lack of progress we've made in Baltimore. Nearly three quarters of voters don't trust elected officials and they want change. We can't be the city of good intentions. We need to act. I've managed large organizations and budgets, built strong teams, managed through crises, and most importantly, I've gotten things done. I'm the only candidate with the independence, experience, integrity, and vision to make Baltimore better. We only have one future, and we have to get that right. All right. Thank, Thank you, ma'am. Yep, we'll move to Mr. Vignaraja. You know, Jason, Baltimore is a city of stories. It's a story of industry and innovation, of music and marvel, of breaking records and shaping the nation. But these days, we are more a story of perpetual mourning, of shattering the wrong records, of making the wrong headlines, of waste and wasted opportunity. But that doesn't have to be our story. Baltimore gave my family our story. It's a story of hard work. It was the story of gratitude and faith. It's a story of a journey across an ocean, of parents who worked hard as teachers every day, of children who dream big, of lives devoted to public service and giving back as a prosecutor, as a public servant every day in this city. This election, with your vote, you get to decide what story we tell next. And if you believe we still have great stories left to write, then this isn't just my campaign, it's your campaign too. Let's write the greatest chapter in Baltimore history and let's do it together. All right, sir, thank you. Mayor Jack Young. Uh, thank you, uh, Jason. Thank you to WBL for this forum. I know that we're experiencing some trying times in our city, but I remain hopeful about moving this city forward. I go to bed every night, wake up every morning, trying to figure out what I can do to make this city a better place for all of Baltimore citizens. If you want someone who can sweet talk you, I'm not that person. But if you want honest transparency and a mayor who always put the people of Baltimore first, then I have provided honest government and quality constituent service my entire career. People know when they call me, I'm going to get things done. I don't care how I get it done, I'll get it done and talk about how we pay for it later. A real change takes place with the people. My message is simple. I will reduce crime, I will clean our streets, and give our children and grandchildren a safe place to learn and play. That's what I'm all about, and I'm glad to know that just about every candidate have really appreciated what I've been doing so far. So thank you all for your confidence in me leading this city, and I will continue to lead this city and make it safe. All right, thank you, sir. T.J. Smith. Well, thank you, uh, WBL, and thank you, Jason, for putting on a professional forum. And thank you, Mayor Young. Uh, all I want to do is support you right now, and uh, that's the right thing to do. And thank everyone who is involved in this. My plan is to call all of the people who are on this call, on this Zoom right now, um, once we have our election and I'm elected mayor, and bring those ideas together, because everyone has different visions of getting where we need to be. We don't all agree. However, I'm the least funded candidate in this race. When I first got into this and some of my advisors saying, uh, who can you call to get a $6,000 donation from? I don't roll like that. I don't have a black book that, that that's deep that ca I can make those type of phone calls. I'm not an asset of corporations. I'm not an asset of big money. I'm a blue collar worker. I've been all my life and I'm a regular person who's had the opportunity to work at the top of three governments. And that's why I was leading in the polls, because I think that the, la the people see that we need a non-politician to make bold decisions and lead our city above board and ethically. All right, and sir, thank I you. I got to get moving. I'm sorry. Brandon Scott, you're up last. 
Thank you, David Bill, and thank you, Jason, for allowing me to talk about uh, my favorite subject, Baltimore, the only place that I call home. I'm in Baltimore, and my story is Baltimore's story. I grew up in Park Heights, a neighborhood that was forgotten by my city government, unless it was Preakness. I saw my first shooting before I was 10 years old, and that's what pushed me into public service. That's why you saw me lead the 300 men, because I knew we had to do that's why I've been calling for changes to our public safety system to make sure that we're impacting the people that we need to remove from our neighborhood for committing violence, but not everybody, because I live through zero tolerance. That's why I believe in fully funding our schools and making sure that every child, no matter their school in Baltimore, gets a 21st century education, because I know it's different for me because I used to roll in park instead of green screen for middle, and it shouldn't be that way. That's why I've dedicated my life to building a better system of city government, fighting for changes in transparency, passing laws, and now I'm frustrated, like every Baltimorean, because I'm tired of waiting on mayors to implement plans. I want to do it myself, but most importantly, do it with you, the citizens of Baltimore, to show that there is a new way forward for our awesome. city. Sir, we got to get rolling. Brandon Scott, thank you. TJ Smith, Mayor Jack Young, through Vignaraja, Mary Miller, and Sheila Dixon. Good luck to you all. Thank you for joining us here on WBAL. Thanks, thank Andy. you. Thank you. Thank you. I have to get back to work. And we want to thank you for joining us for our debate tonight. If you missed any of the debate, you can watch it in its entirety on the WBAL TV mobile app and our website, WBALTV.com. Now, we had to cut one question for time. You can hear that bonus question and all the candidates' responses. That's on our website and app as well. A reminder, Maryland's primary election is less than three weeks away. Most of us will be voting by mail due to the pandemic. If you've already received your ballot, you may have noticed something is off. The State Board of Elections saying that all ballots will have April 28th printed at the top. That was the original date of the primary election, which was later pushed back to June 2nd. And we're told that there was enough, not enough time to reprint all of those ballots. So yes, your ballot has the wrong date, but that does not impact your ballot being counted. Remember, and this is very important, you must both sign and print your name on your ballot and on the postage paid return envelope when you mail in your ballot. If you do not follow these steps exactly, your ballot may not be counted. All ballots must be mailed or postmarked by June 2nd. I'm Jason Newton. Thank you for watching from all of us here at WBAL-TV. Good night.